Thank you, Danny. So hello everyone. Like Danny said, I'm Emily Lacey. I'm the Director of Sponsor Projects and today we're going to be talking about our internal funding opportunities. You may hear me say seed grant as well, but it's the same thing. Internal funding, seed grants, it's all the same thing. We'll be going through all of the offerings that we have coming up this spring. We'll go through each individual program. I'll kind of talk about the history of it, um, what are some commonalities between all of it, and I'll also show you um, at the end, we'll show you the uh, website that has all the offerings, offerings on it and then and we'll also show you the OR portal where you go to actually apply for them. So how did we start with seed grants? We started seed grants probably about five years ago, and you probably heard the terminology, the NREF fund. And so NREF was, uh, is the National Research University Fund, and that came about several years ago where the state of Texas got together and they wanted to find ways to funnel more research to Texas. And so they developed a pot of money that would establish a pot of money, once you met certain criteria, you would have access to that pot of money. And so UTD became eligible about five years ago and we met the criteria, one of which was that we had to have a certain amount of federal research expenditures and we did that. And so we had access to the money. And so we, when they were looking at the money and trying to figure out what should we do with this, the intent has to be for research. And so what better way than to do seed grants? And so our intent with the seed grants is to grow research. And so grow research, research can go in many ways. It can be establishing a center. It can be getting more research expenditures. It can be just building our brand and attracting talent. So all of that plays into research. Now the seed grants, the ultimate goal of the seed grants is to build our research empire by getting more research expenditures. That can also be developing more center type proposals or cluster hirings and having seed grants that will allow those people to come here and it attracts them. And so the seed grants are that is the intent, but if you are a science or a, I'm sorry, um, a social science or an arts person, don't let that scare you because we do have programs that are specifically for people who are not necessarily submitting proposals, but there are ways that you can still grow the research brand and grow Dallas or, or UT Dallas. And so we'll talk about that as we get to into each individual program. And so let's talk about some of the commonalities. So all of them are meant to fund research. We, our priority is new research. So this is not intended to just continue a project that you've been working on for many years and now the funder has decided not to fund you. Our intent is to find new ways, new novel concepts and new teams. We want to build new teams, new collaborations, new areas, new new target areas. I mean, there with the CHIPS Act, you know, new stuff came out all the time about what the federal government is targeting. And so that's what we want to get in on because that's where the money is. And so if you're submitting a proposal and there there is a, a tie basically between an existing team that already has some support, has already done stuff, and a brand new team. That tie is going to be broken by going with the new team because that's our prioritization. And so a, each um, solicitation does state that in there, that that is where our priority is. That does not mean that you can't apply if you already have funding with your collaborator or anything, just that the priority is for newness. Um, all of the solicitations have the similar structures and similar guidelines. We'll go through what the differences are between them, but they all have the same format, the same, um, the RFP is laid out exactly the same. They all look very similar. They have the same um, structure in what we're asking you to submit. One of the items that we ask you to submit is the external funding opportunities. And that is a section that is part of the application where you are telling us, how is this going to grow? What is your intent? Who are you trying to get funding from? What is the program that you're trying to get funding from? And what is the dollar amount that you are trying to submit? And the intent of that document is is what is our return on investment? What are we trying to get? How is it going to grow your program? And so it, the reviewers can look at that and they can say, yes, that is the perfect opportunity to go for. You're going to be successful. Or they might say, you will have absolutely no chance because these people over here have completely cornered that market and nobody can get in. Or they might say, hey, that's good, but have you thought about this one over here? And so that, that document is really important because that's showing us where you're going to go and what your plan is. And so that helps us help you. And the reviewers are tasked with identifying if what you're doing is going to be successful. We don't, we want 
want you to be successful, but we also want it to be successful for UTD. And so that that document helps lay that out. Now, if you are an arts person or a social science person, you may not have that. I mean, a lot of the times arts people, there are no funding opportunities or they're very small or you have to match it. Like it will give you 20,000, but you have to give us 20 as well. And so those are not going to be that's not going to be the same criteria that we hold for the hard science people, for the STEM people. So for the arts people, what you can do is show in that in that section, how are you going to grow the UTD brand? Are you going to bring recognition to us? Are you going to bring news media to us? Are you going to bring a whole group of grad students to us? Anything like that. You're What you're trying to do there is sell how you are making UTD more nationally recognized. And so don't be scared if you don't have any funding, but find another way because we do need to find out what, what is the benefit to us giving you money. That's what we're trying to get to. Um, and so also the um, seed grants have specific costs that are allowed and unallowed. And so on the seed grants, no seed grant has indirect cost, and none of the seed grants allow faculty salary. What they are intended to do is fund grad students, postdocs, um, travel, publications, supplies, equipment, any of those things. We also don't want to send money outside the university in like a subcontract situation. So if you maybe you need to characterize some nano chips or something, that's OK. That's a service. That's that's still for us, but we don't want to send money off to another university. We're trying to grow our program, not theirs. Um, and so just pay attention to where the money is going. Um, we do have, we in the past, we have had some opportunities where we partner with other organizations and the RFP will very clearly state what money can go to them if that is there. But all the ones that we are offering this year, the money stays at UTD. All right, so now let's get into the actual programs. So the first one is not an actual seed grant, but it is a way to be involved in the seed grants. So it is the opportunity to be an Office of Research and Innovation seed grant reviewer. And so this came about because the way that the program has worked in the past is everybody submits their applications. The day after the application deadline passes, I go in, I do a compliance check on everybody, and then I start trying to find reviewers. And each application gets three reviews. And so we had 80 over 80 applications last year. That's a lot of reviewers and that's a lot of people that I have to find who have the time and the expertise to get the reviews completed. And it's getting more challenging as the time goes by because people are very busy. And so we thought we would try this year to have paid reviewers. And so this is a paid opportunity. You will get $1,500. Half of it will be in January, half of it will be in December. And this is a one year time frame. So you will serve from January 1st all the way until December. December 31st. Now the majority of the work will be in the spring because that's when all of our seed grants are. So the seed grant deadlines are the end of February, March, and April. And so the reviews will take place from March 1st until about May 31st. That'll be the busiest times. Um, my intent with seed grants is when the deadline passes, I want to get it to the hands of the reviewers within the next couple of business days. And then I want to give the reviewers two weeks and then we have that final week to make decisions and get cost centers. And I, my goal is always to be done with the deadlines before the next deadline happens. And so I, I'm trying to stick to that because it makes it much easier. And so you can see why that's challenging to find reviewers ad hoc who have that time to give me and that can do it as quickly as I need and have the expertise. And so I'm looking for people who have a broad range of expertise. I need some science people too. I, I need arts people. I need across the board because these are reviewers for all of the C grant programs. It'll be dependent upon how many you review will be dependent upon what your expertise is and who we have submit. I can never predict how many will submit. Um, last year, like I said, we had over 80. It may not be that this year. It may be less, it may be more, never know. Just depends on how excited everybody is. The key on this is that if you sign up to be a C grant reviewer, you cannot submit C grants because you are a reviewer. And because the reviews are for all the programs, you cannot apply for any of the programs. So if your intent is to apply as to one of the C grants that we'll talk about after this slide, you cannot be a reviewer. Now the deadline for this is December 15th, and so we'll be moving fairly quickly to get these established. Um, the other piece of this is not just seed grants, but the um, OORI also does limited submission reviews. And so a limited submission is when an, a sponsor says that 
we as an organization can submit so many proposals. Um, the best example I can give is the NSF MRIs and the secret high impact high research. Those are the two that always have to go to a limited submission contest because we always have more applicants than we have openings. Um, so this these reviewers will provide those reviews as well. And those are those can happen throughout the year. Most of them tend to be in the fall, but honestly, there's maybe four or five of those a year. So there's not a lot um, and there's not the restriction for the limited submissions as there is on the seed grants, you could still apply as a limited submission and I will just find other reviewers. I'm not going to need as many for the limited submissions as I will for the seed grants. Um, so there is my pitch to try and sign up to be a reviewer. We'll go through the OR portal as to how to um, apply. But please, if you have any interest, go ahead and be a reviewer. And it also helps you learn the process. You see what people are submitting. You see maybe there's a potential for collaboration with some of the, the people who are submitting. But you can also help us fine tune these offerings. If you're like, I don't think this is really doing what you think it needs to do. Or maybe we need to change this language to be this. Or this review criteria would be better if it were over here or it was rephrased. That's all the information that we need. And we need science people to be able to tell us that. OK, so that's the Office of Research and Innovation Reviewer. So now we'll get into the actual seed grants. So the first one is the Road to DC program. This has been around for a very long time, since the very beginning, and it's been very successful. Um, it was pre-COVID, it was extremely successful because everybody traveled and everybody wanted to have in-person meetings. Now we're in a little bit of a different world, so we've had to change it up just a little bit. But the Road to DC program is meant to help you get face-to-face -face with program officers who can give you advice or help you get funding. And so there's two pieces to it. There's the mentor mapping and the take flight. The mentor mapping is where you are paired with an established mentor. That's somebody who's had funding in the past. Maybe they've even been a program officer and they will walk you through the steps of how to how to approach a program officer how do i talk to them what do i say to them um when is the best time to reach them what if they you know completely ignore me how do i get a hold of them they'll walk you through all that and they'll mentor you through that the take flight part is when you actually go to see them so when you have your um, travel you have a meeting with them we will pay for it um, you can go through both programs if you don't need the mentor mapping or you already know you've already done that part you can just do the take flight. Um, they are two separate programs though. So if you want to do mentor mapping and take flight, you would need to apply for both of them. And this is open until February 29th. And yes, next year is a leap year. That's not a mistake. They are open until the end of February and you can apply for them. Um, this has been really successful and it's, it's a great opportunity, especially for newer professors who haven't, who, maybe haven't perfected your elevator speech or you're just unsure how to proceed or to an established professor who is going in a new direction with a new agency and you're like, I can't get in the door. Do you have any connections to help me get in the door? So it's great for all of those. Um, so that's the road to DC. The next one is the new faculty research symposium. And if you had the pleasure of going yesterday, we actually had our new faculty research symposium. We got to meet a lot of new faculty and hear about their research. And it was great to, to see what new stuff is being brought into the university and all the enthusiasm and excitement that comes with that. So this opportunity is specifically for new faculty. And our, ver our definition of new faculty are people who have started as of January of 2023. Um, if you started prior to that, you are what we call an established faculty. And so this grant, the requirement is that one person has to be a newly hired person who presented at the new faculty research symposium. Um, they have to have been a presenter. And so if you need a list of those people, then you can reach out to us and we can provide that. But they have to be one of those individuals. Um, the other person can be anybody else as long as they were not one. Of, well, I'm sorry, they could actually be it could be two newly hired people, um, but one has to have presented at the symposium. And um, the intent here is for it to be interdisciplinary, so it shouldn't be two people from the same department doing the same research. It needs to be interdisciplinary where we're building new collaborations. But this is this is designed for an established person to work with a new person and provide some mentorship in some capacity, depending upon what is needed. Um, but also just to find new new avenues for funding. And it's it's a small amount of money because it's twenty five thousand dollars, but that's enough to fund a grad student that can help just get to the point where you 
you can actually submit a proposal. Um, so that's what the new faculty research symposium is. It in the past we did have it as a requirement that the established person had to have been at the symposium and seen the event. We have changed the requirement this year, so not to cause any confusion with anybody, but only the newly hired person has to have presented. The rest do not have to have even attended the event. That is a change for this year from the past years. So that's the NFRS. You'll sometimes hear us refer to it as that. All right, now we're on to the heart. So this is specifically for our arts people. Um, and this is this is exactly what I was talking about where there's not a criteria that you actually have to find external funding. That's actually not one of the review criteria in this. It is just how are you going to improve UTD's um, reputation, I guess you could say. So what you need to tell us is what are you trying to do and how is that contributing to the UTD philosophy? Some of the examples of people who have been successful on the HEARTS programs is there's sometimes they will go to visit someone like to build a collaboration or to do some preliminary work, learn some training of some kind. We've had um, one individual actually went to look at archives and so she they should need to travel money in order to get there to access the archives. Um, some uh, several of them, I think, have been to finish a book, and so they needed to go and do some research in the field. So those are the types of things that we've seen on the hearts. But again, don't be scared if you don't have external funding because that's not a requirement on this one. It's just uh, how, what are you doing? What are you accomplishing? And how is that going to help the AHT group, but also UT Dallas in general? And this one is for $8,000. It's for one year, and it's due on leap year as well, or leap day, I guess I should say. All right, and then the next one is kind of similar, although this one does have an external funding requirement to it. This is the social sciences one, and this is actually one of our most successful ones because we've had, I think, two or three people who have received a social science have received an NSF award after they got the social science grant. So social science is pretty much mostly EPS faculty because they kind of bridge the gap between AHT and the STEM fields, and it's designed to to help you re reach your goals, but there should also be some external funding associated with it. There should be something out there that will fund what you're doing. Um, <clears throat> it it could be, I mean, it doesn't necessarily, I'm, I, I said EPS, but it does not necessarily have to be EPS. It could be anybody. If you feel like this fits what you're doing, then that is fine, apply for that. This does not have a requirement that you have a partner, which is one of the few that doesn't require you to have multiple people involved. This is the same as the hearts. It has $8,000 and it's for a, a year. Um, and again, it's it's what will push you over the finish line in order to get some funding. And what do you need in order to accomplish that? And it's due on February 29th as well. Then we come to our most popular one. This is the one that gets the most applicants every year, and this is the seed program for interdisciplinary research, which is SPIRE. You've probably heard us say SPIRE several times. Um, this is this is to fund new groups of people working together, and so they need to be from different areas. It can be different schools, like you could have somebody from BBS combined with somebody from ECS. It could be different departments. You could have somebody in bioengineering working with somebody in mechanical engineering, and it could also be within the same, same area. So I learned a few years ago that electrical engineering has several different areas in it. There's like a software and a hardware, and I can't remember what the other side is. It could be somebody from the software side and the hardware side getting together. The key on the Spire is you need to explain to the reviewers why it is interdisciplinary, especially if you're in the same department, because uh, and I think there's the differences in chemistry too. There, there's We've seen different varieties, but you need to explain to the reviewers why this is considered interdisciplinary and not that you just forgot that y'all were in the same department. So it, that needs to be how you write the proposal is explaining that this is this area and I'm this area and they don't go together and we're coming together in order to do this. So just make sure that that is very clear in your proposal because that's the most comments we get is from the reviewers is that this does not feel like it's interdisciplinary. They're both in whatever. And so just make sure that you you have made that distinction and so that it it's there's no question and so the spire is 
you want two people coming together. You also want it to be a new concept. So again, we don't want it to be a group of people who've are been funded for the past 20 years, they're best friends, and they just want to keep working together. We want it to be new. We want it to be a new group of people, but we also want it to be a new direction of what you're funding. We want to try and spur new innovation, new high impact, high risk areas. And, and some sponsors will not, are not as happy to fund high risk because you know you may not get what you pay for but we are willing to do that and that is what the seed grow program is to do is to to do the stuff that the other funders won't do um the spire is also our highest value one it's sixty thousand. um it is for a year and you do have to include that external funding opportunity where you tell us what am i submitting to um and how are we going to get sustainable funding beyond the spire program all right Next is TechSace. So the TechSace Collaboration Initiative, TCI is what we call it internally, is kind of like the Spire a little bit, I guess you could say, because it requires interdisciplinarity, but it requires somebody who is part of TechSace. And so TechSace is our group in ECS that is founded by um, Dr. O. And so you, uh, in the solicitation, there's a link that will provide you a list of all the people who are TechSace faculty. So if you don't know of somebody or you're like, I don't know if they technically are listed, you can go to that website and find their name. Um, so this initiative is to have that person join with an outside person and find ways that they can collaborate together and get their funding. Um, the the Texas person gets five thousand dollars, and the non Texas person gets thirty five thousand dollars. So it's a forty thousand dollar total award. Um, but you do have to partner with somebody who is in Texas. So just make sure that you have that person, and they are included on there. And this one is a one year award as well, and it's due at the end of March. We've now moved on to the March deadlines. All right. Now we're going to move on to the April deadline. So the April deadline starts with the SPARK program, and this was a new program that we started last year. And the intent of this one was to help the faculty who are not, not generally new. These are usually going to be assistant professors or full professors who have had a, I don't know, a dearth of funding where they haven't had any funding for at least 24 months. And so a little clarification on this part. The 24 months means your last funding ended 24 months ago, not I got my last award 24 months ago, but it's still going. You have to have had a period of two years where you did not have funding. There was nothing coming in the door. And what this is meant to do is spark the new research direction you're going. Maybe you your original idea reached the end of its path or you're like, I don't know where else to go for this. I feel like I've explored all of it or you want to learn something new or you want to collaborate with someone. That's what this program is for. It's $50,000 and it's for you to do whatever you need to do, whether you need to go take a sabbatical and learn a new skill or you just need to get in the lab and start trying some new things. See what happens. See something that sparks your interest or maybe you want to try and work with somebody else who has some knowledge that you need. I mean, it could be any of those, but it's meant to spark a stalled research program is the intent. So make, make sure you're aware of the 24 months because there was some confusion last year about that, but it's you have to go 24 months without funding, not I just haven't, I still have funding, but I haven't gotten any in two years. It's no funding at all for 24 months. And that one is due at the end of April. Okay, so now we get to a brand new opportunity. This one is brand new this year. So this is the AHT STEM Collaboration Grant. And the this is for a specific, you have to have an AHT member on the program, and then you collaborate with somebody who is in the STEM field. And so this is meant to try and help a, to help the STEM people realize the value of the AHT people, but also the AHT people to see, hey, there is funding opportunities out there if I can just get over the, the STEM hump. And some ways that we've seen this successful is we've seen um, specifically computer science people, they use the um, the former ATech people, now AHT people, to visualize things and, and turn graphics into things, but also the virtual reality of ATech is perfect for STEM. And so this is a way for everybody to kind of find new ways to present information, but how do we make it more attractive to funders. And so we, we're hoping that this is going to be super successful and open the door to brand new collaborations and ways and different funders too. Um, and so this is for 
all HT, you have to have an AHT member, and then it can be from any other area, just as long as there's some sort of STEM, which is basically everybody else on the campus besides AHT. Um, this one is for 25,000, and it's for one month. I mean, one month. It's for a year, and it's due at the end of April. And then we're going to move on to another one who's kind of similar. This is the second year for the JSOM STEAM collaboration. And this one, instead of having an AHT requirement, it has a JSOM requirement. And this was meant to try and spur some collaboration with the JSOM group and the rest of the campus. And so finding ways that we can incorporate the management perspective into the STEAM world. Um, I was trying to think. A lot of the ones that we saw last year was on, it was even some sustainability pieces from the JSOM. And that's one of the ways that I'm not sure everybody on campus is aware that the management group has a lot of information on sustainability, like the um, supply chain and the um, environmental effects. And that can be put into any sort of STEAM application, um, especially with the funders. That's a big deal right now is sustainability. And so there's many ways that you can you can interact with the JSON people. And so this one is for 25,000 as well, and it's for a year and it's due at the end of April as well. And now we're on to the two programs that we have that do not have deadlines. They're available at any point in time, and that's just because of the nature of what they are. So the first one is the PREP, which is the Proposal Resubmission Enhancement Program. And this is meant to get you over the finish line to get funded. And so the requirement for this is that you have to have submitted your proposal and you have to have gotten reviews that were really good, but not enough to get you the award. And so you were close to the pay line, but not quite there. Maybe you need you know, more preliminary data. Maybe you need a new publication, anything like that, that what can we do to get you over that line? And so one of the requirements of this is you actually have to provide us with the review from your previous application so that we can see what the reviewer said and we can make sure that your um, your proposed project addresses that. And so the budget is 25,000, which is usually enough in order to just get you over that hump because normally you're just right there or maybe they just didn't quite have enough money. But if you do one little thing, it'll make it better. And usually the program officers will provide you with what exactly is missing and what you need to do. Um, so this one is continuous because of that. Um, we don't know when everybody will have their proposals due. The in This is a 12 month program, but you may not need all 12 months or you may need you may have to submit it later. It just depends on what the funding announcement is, uh, but you need to at least be semi prepared to resubmit in a reasonable time frame um, and have a clear plan of what you are, what deficiencies are you addressing in order to get to that pay line. And then the last one is the workshop grant. So this one is available year round and this is intended to support any type of workshop that you're having here at UTD preferably with outside people because we are trying to build the UTD brand. So we want to bring recognition to us. This could be where you're having a symposium, you're having a conference, maybe your program officer is called and said, hey, I need a venue to host this or I'm coming into town, get a bunch of people together. That will work as well. Um, it, we've had small events, we've had big events. It doesn't matter. The amount is $3,000. And I do want to say that this is intended to help you cover the cost, but we are not going to run your workshop for you. So we do have an events team, but this is not their services. This is, we will provide you some money to help you achieve this. We will help you with it. We can give you some guidance, but we're not actually providing our services for the workshop grant. It is a monetary help in order to bring some significance to UTD. Um, and so that's the workshop. We we had a lot of them before COVID. We haven't had as many since then, which is natural. Um, but if you, if, if we start having more workshops again, feel free, apply. Remember that we exist and that it it's available at any point in time. Um, in the when I show you the OR portal before I forget, the the workshop and the prep do have a December 31st deadline, but that's just because I do it one year at a time so I can keep up with who submitted that year. So don't let that alarm you that it has a deadline. There'll be a new one that opens up for 2024, um, but just in case I forget to mention that and it seems to contradict. All right. So here is a screenshot from the OR portal. I'll go to it in just a moment. Um, this is where you will actually go to submit your proposal. This You can also find some of the program announcements there. Um, it has links to our webpage, but this is the main OR portal where you log in and you 
apply and you um, submit your application. And so hang on, let me pull up the actual OR portal. Oop. All right, can everybody see that? All right, so this is the web page. If you go to research.utdallas.edu, and then it's over here on the right-hand side, I'm sorry, left-hand side, internal funding right here. And so here are all the opportunities we just talked about, all right here. And then there are also big blocks right here where you can specifically click on them. It goes the same place, either one you choose. So I'm gonna go to the Spire, just because that's usually the most popular one. And so we'll go through the RFP. So the first section is the overview. So this is basically what I just told you of what is our intent? What are we looking to fund? What um, what is our priorities? Things like that. And then you have the award information, which tells you how much, how long, and whether you can reapply. And then here's the submission deadline. And if you click on this button, it takes you actually into the OR portal. So I'll click on that in a moment. I don't want to leave yet. The program guidelines give you a little bit more information as to what our what our priorities are and what we're targeting and then pay attention to the eligibility because there there is different eligibility for different things the main key on the eligibility is that you have to be basically pi eligible which means you have to be a full-time faculty or a full-time member at ut dallas um, we don't allow adjuncts affiliates visiting researchers and postdocs as pis or co-pis it needs to be somebody who is an actual generally a faculty member, maybe a center director, um, something along those lines. And then there is a restriction on all of our seed grants that if you have received a seed grant in that program, you are not eligible for that program for three years. So in the example that we have online is 2019. If you won one in 2019, you can't submit again until 2022. So we've done this enough that there are some people who are eligible for the same program again now that we're in year five or six. Um, and then if you've already won an award with the same people that you're submitting, you're not eligible. There has to be new. Like I said, we're looking for new ideas, new ways to get funding. It, we feel like if we've already given you money, then you should be able to get the money on your own since we seeded you at the beginning. Um, and then there are some restrictions on um, how much money you can have in your discretionary accounts. And if there's a certain amount that we may ask for a co-funding situation as well. And then almost all of them have this restriction, which seems to be confusing every year, is that you can only submit one proposal to each program. So you can't be a, a PI and a co-PI on a different proposal to the same to the SPIRE program. You could submit a SPIRE application, you could submit an NFRS, you can submit a PrEP, you could submit a workshop, but you can't submit multiple SPIRES. You have to pick the one that you feel is going to be the most successful and the one you're most passionate about, and that's the one that you need to be on. And it's for PIs and co-PIs. So you can, if you're in hot demand, more power to you, congratulations, but you have to pick which one you want to actually be on because if there's multiples on there, then one of them will have to be declined, basically. And then here's where we talk about the allowable and unallowable expenses, which we we already addressed a little bit. And then this part, please pay attention to this part. This is just as important as applying to NSF or NIH. You must follow the rules. Um, I try to log in before the deadlines and do a pre-review of applications to make sure that um, everything is correct. I, if we get to the point where the deadline has passed and I'm looking at a proposal and it's supposed to be limited to three pages and you submitted five pages, that's not fair. That That is not allowed for the federal government and it shouldn't be allowed for us either. We're working on everybody being on the same, same footing and if you have two extra pages to extol the virtues of your research, that's not fair to everybody else. And so if you if the deadline is passed and you've not follow the rules, then your proposal has to be disqualified. But I do try and do pre-check so that I can catch those and still make it so that you can make your revisions and then resubmit. But make sure you follow the directions. These are very formulaic, I guess you could say, but also I feel they're very clear. We've been doing this for long enough that I feel it's clear, but if there's anything that you don't understand, please just reach out to me. Or if you have a way that you're like, this doesn't make sense, you need to change it, or why is this even important, please reach out to us. It may not be important anymore. It may have been at the beginning. Um, I would like to point this part out. It's really awesome if you follow this particular point where it's one combined document in PDF. That works really great because when a reviewer opens it up and there's like 12 attachments, it gets a little hard to look at things and it gets a little difficult for me as well. And so it's much easier if you just combine it into one PDF document. 
And then here's the piece I talked about at the beginning about the external funding opportunities. This is really relevant because this is helping us understand what the return of investment is and how it's going to benefit UTD. So take the time. Don't just put NSF's MRI. Amazing. It's awesome. That Talk about it a little bit. Tell us why it's important. And then the, so the next section is the application review process and evaluation criteria. This is our um, basically our transparency of how we're going to rank these, what the criteria is going to be. And so each of these categories gets its own ranking and then we combine all those to get a final ranking and then we make the award after that. Um, but this, this mirrors the criteria that's listed prior to that in the program guidelines section. And then the net the last two sections are the awardee requirements and the other terms and conditions. This is what the post award requirements are. You have to submit a report at the end because we want to know what exactly you did with the money. What were your goals? What did you achieve? Um, and what were your what were your external submissions? We need to know what you actually submitted to. Um, and then we may ask you to present if you did actually get, have some success and you you know you got a big award out of it. We may ask you to you know help us out with publicizing it or anything like that. Um, and then the the usual terms and conditions that you know you if you have human subjects or animals you can't do it without the proper protocols. And then the contact at the end. So this is the same. Um, it's the same look and feel for all of the applications. So I just wanted to walk you through it so you know what's important. And so now if we go back up there to that apply button, there we go. If you click on the apply button, it takes you into the OR portal, which is just or.utdallas.edu, O-A-R. And then it takes you in here. But if we go, let's go back to the beginning so we can show everybody how to get there. So first you'll log in. I'm already logged in, but if you weren't, you would log in right up here. Um, and then you can get to the C grants in two different ways. Right here is internal funding. You could literally just click on that, or you can click up here and the same menu appears, and then you click on internal funding. Either way, you get to the same place. So you just click on that, and then it's going to take you to all the opportunities. Now these are ordered based on their deadlines. So we have the re the reviewer is first because the deadline is coming up in the next few weeks. And then you'll see the workshop one, which is this is where I said that you know it is continuous. It does have a December deadline, but it'll be updated. Um, and then we get to the take flight, and then you know, hearts, and then there's the mentor mapping is right here. So those were two separate ones, but those are the ones that are due on February 29th, and then you get to the ones in March. But you'll just look for the one that you want to apply to, and then when you find what you're looking for, then you can hit apply. And it takes you into the opportunity. When you get into the opportunity, you can click this, and it's going to take you right back to the main web page that we have. This does the exact same thing. So if I clicked on that, it would take me right back over here. Um, but when you apply, you're going to put in the title of your program. You're going to select what school you're in. You can type an abstract here, or you can just say see attachment. And then this is the attachment. This is where I would prefer it to be one PDF document instead of multiple 25 documents, which makes it a little difficult. And then down here is where you would put your name. This will be your name, and you will be the PI or whoever is the PI. And then when you want to add more people, you need to put them here. Now you can add non UTD people if they are integral to your project. So when you select it, you type in their name, we're under UTD people, and then you'll select what their role is. And if it's a non-UTD person, then you can just type in their information. It is helpful on like the Spires and the NFRS and the Texas one if you add the other person so that I, it's easy for me to identify this is the group. So if you have multiple co-PIs, put them here. You don't necessarily have to put everybody who's a key person or anything, but it is helpful for me to at a glance tell who the PIs and the co-PIs are to make sure that you've met the eligibility requirements. It makes it a little bit easier. It's also easier for the reviewers because it's very clear as to who is what on the project. And then you just submit it and it goes into my queue and I'll let you know what's happening. And I think that's all. There we go. All right, Danny, what questions do we have? Uh, well, we have one in the chat. And then again, I want to remind people, feel free to put your questions in the chat and I will read them aloud. Or if you want to raise your virtual hand, I will unmute you and you can go ahead and speak up. Uh, so the first question from the chat is, uh, can you please clarify the $100,000 in reachment or in research enhancement part. I'm a bit worried that some folks I have considered writing with might not be eligible because of their funding. Even though I'm a new PI, I'm worried they aren't eligible to be a co-PI. Thanks. Yes, I definitely can. And we did add some language in, in this 
specifically because people got nervous about the startup. They wanted to know if their startup funding counted and it does not count. Startup funding is not considered in that. This is just for if they have access to a chair account or if they have research enhancement that's over it. And I'll be honest with you, there are very few people on this campus that have more than $100,000 in their research enhancement. Um, it's very few and far between and those people know who they are. Um, so normally this doesn't come into play. Um, if they happen to, you can reach out to me and I can look into it and kind of get some more clarification, but startup does not count. I want to, want to make sure that that's clear that, yes, you are a new faculty who came in with money. You should not be punished just because you came in with a startup package that is meant to help you, not hurt you. Thanks, Emily. Do we have any other questions? Um, again, feel free to raise your virtual hand and we will unmute you um, or go ahead and put it in the chat. And all of these are active on the website. They're all available. They're ready. You don't have to wait until the deadline. I know that that's human nature, that we like to wait until the last minute. You can submit it early. That'll give me time to actually give you feedback, um, but submit it at any point in time. We do have one more that will be coming. I forgot to mention this. We do have one more C grant opportunity that we are finalizing. This one is going to be a collaboration with the Southwest Research Institute, otherwise known as SWERI. We're still finalizing a name on this, but it's going to be where the a UTD person collaborates with a SWERI investigator and then they work together on a project. So this is one where it's kind of like the Spire except that it's with an outside entity and it's with the SWERI group and we'll have a link to all the SWERI people so you can see who they are. But we're still finalizing the details. It's going to be funded partly by us and partly by SWERI. So that'll be coming soon. That's to build your anticipation and get your excitement going. Um, but that'll be one more that we're adding. Oh, and I see the question. Any plan to bring back Southwestern? The the Cobra is the one that we had with um, UT Southwestern that was to build the connections between UTD and UT Southwestern. Not for this year. We may do it in the future, but not for this year. We had it last year and we're, we're waiting to see what exactly comes out of those. Um, the previous batch uh, was like three years before that, but we also wanted to see what happens with the new um, bio building that's being built between UT Southwestern and UTD to see if that spurs innovation on its own that maybe doesn't need seed grants, but we're just waiting on that one. And so we're offering the SWERI instead to try and see if we can find some, I guess for lack of a word, friends over there to partner with. And, and the, the COBRA is a very popular one. We know it's very popular. <laughs> Um, Emily, I just have a kind of common question that I'll get. Um, I've had multiple questions about um, how many of each um, internal fund? funding that we give out, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know the answer is it depends, um, but I'll throw that one to you. <laughs> it does depend. Um, I will say that the NFRS is our most successful um, because we only get about four to five applications and we fund two. So that's almost a 50% ratio. The Spire, we get the most applications on it. So the ratio is lower. However, it is still fairly high. It's usually at about 30, 35%. Um, and Spire is one that if we have funding left over at the end of the year, we go back and we fund the people who were close to the pay line, but not quite. Um, and then the social and the hearts, those are about like the NFRS. Um, last year, we did not get hardly any applications and we're not really sure why, but in previous years, we've had about six to eight applicants and we fund about two, which is still a fairly good ratio. Um, and then the, let's see, what other ones are there? This is brand new, so we don't have any on that. This one was just last year. We, we probably had about a 40% success rate on the JSOM STEAM, and the SPARK grant was about 50% as well on that one. So, I mean, we have a pretty good success rate. The SPIRE is just the most competitive because it's the, A, it's the most money, but it also gives you the most opportunities. Um, and so it it is a little bit lower, but it's still a very good. It's much better than the federal government, I'll say that. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. We do have another question in the chat uh, for NFRS. Can both PI and co-PI be new hires after January 2023 with one presented at NFRS and the other participated? It can. That was brought up last year. We we had never had anybody have that situation and we, we did. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I believe they won one last year too. Um, that is absolutely just as long as one person out of the at least two people was presenting, then yes, it would be perfectly okay. Congrats on making a friend. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right, do we have any other questions? Again, feel free to raise your hand um, or put them in the chat. Um, I will give it about 30 more seconds if anyone else has any questions. Um, Emily Lacey is uh, your go-to person um, for any seed grant questions, uh, but myself and Suzanne Head uh, can also help uh, navigate those questions. So feel free to reach out to any of us um, if you do have any additional questions. And um, you can, again, find I was sending links in the chat as Emily was talking about each of the um, internal funding opportunities. So. Uh, Go ahead and explore those links. Let us know. Um, one thing I'll say as well is people will ask me, like, should I um, apply for it? The answer is yes, apply for it. It's not going to hurt if it, if you get told no, right? And I would say it's generally um, an easy application um, compared to other, other opportunities. So um, I would say just go for it. It won't hurt. Yes, and I, I will add to that that everybody gets reviewer feedback, and so yep. even the winners get the feedback to help them of, of what the reviewers felt were the strengths and what they felt were the weaknesses. In every single category, we have a strength and a weakness, and so that's to help you, um, and sometimes it's just because the page limitation. I mean, three pages is not a lot to give a whole bunch of detail, but they can also give you some ideas, and I've seen several times where the reviewers have said, hey, have you thought about this? Or maybe if you added this, you could even submit to this agency and give it a whirl and see what happens. Um, but the, the reviewers really do take it seriously, and they think about it, and they try and give the best feedback. And so, I mean, like Danny said, just apply because you never know what's going to come out of it and what helpful suggestions. But also, if you're not ready to, just offer to be a reviewer because that way you get to see the inside. And that's not just for me and a plea for me, although, yes, please be a reviewer. But you should sign up to be a reviewer for the agencies. That's the best way to see what they fund, what they're what their schedule is, what their priorities are, what they're looking for, who to avoid, who to, you know, actually talk to. But I mean, that's the best way where you're going to see, oh, this is how to be successful. This is how I should do it. Or I should have written it like that. That's very clear. And so there, you can be a reviewer for every single agency. They're always asking for them. I mean, you just go to the website and look for how to be a reviewer and they'll tell you exactly what you need to do. I mean, some of them pay you just like we do. So, you know, there's opportunities there too. Thanks, Emily. One more question in the chat. Uh, for AHT STEM, does the PI have to be from AHT and the co-PI from STEM? Yes. Yes, it's meant to bridge the gap between the two, so it can't be two AHT people. In that case, you should probably go with the HEARTS grant instead because that is mainly for arts people, um, but the AHT and STEM is, you could have two arts people and then add a STEM person. That is a possibility as well, but there does need to be at least one AHT and at least one STEM person. Does it matter who is PI and co-PI? No. Like which, okay. So nope, just as AHT long as there's two. PI or co-PI, got mm -hmm. it. Yep. Um, great, and then um, again, Final questions, but I'll also say as well, um, the OAR portal, if you're not um, familiar with that, is also the way to um, submit federal grants and other external grants as well. Um, Emily's team does have a four business day deadline, um, so I'd really encourage you to make sure that you are uh, meeting with her and her team um, and letting them know the second you have um, any proposal thoughts um, or ideas, especially for those external funding. Yes, and we're coming up a winter break, which means our deadline may be before the winter break if your deadline is sometime early in January, any time from, I think we've calculated January 11th or so, any time before January 11th, you may actually have to submit everything to us prior to the break. So if you have anything due from now until January 15th, please, please, please let us know because we need to establish the internal deadlines and make sure we meet them. All right, um, I think we are good to go. Again, this is recorded and will be sent out um, here in a couple weeks.